the um, there is advice for student teachers from their students. The students in Miss Amato's elementary school class gave this advice as a gift to their student teacher on her last day. And this is out of uh, the 11th edition educational psychology book by Anita Wolf Folk. Wolf Folk. Wolf Folk. Educational psychology. So, so we're learning about. Uh, uh, young people's brains and how it operates and how how they think and understand the world so here's a list of 13 uh, items that the students are expecting or that they want out of their teachers number one teach us as much as you can number two give us homework number three help us when we have problems with our work number four help us do the right thing number five help us make a family in school Number six, read books to us. Number seven, teach us to read. Number eight, help us write about faraway places. Number nine, give us lots of compliment, like, oh, that's so beautiful. Number 10, smile at us. Number 11, take us for walks and or trips. Number 12, respect us. And number 13, help us get our education. So there's a list. There's a list of 13 things uh, that the student body wants out of their teachers at least for the students in Miss Amato's class elementary school um, and if we're being serious about our education then since there is a crisis in education we need to listen to the students and to the student body because they understand what they um, what they can learn they understand their brains better than anybody else so uh, if we really want to teach our students then we should guide them and we should in encourage their curiosity uh, in fact, 95% of our job should be to inspire that curiosity. So there's uh, two more resources. I got the uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed here, and then I got um, uh, this uh, J Dr. Jason J. Campbell. He made an outline. I just got off the internet. Dr. Jason J. Campbell, if, if that was readable. Uh, but he was saying about the teacher-student relationship. He, uh, he summed up Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And he said the, the teacher-student relationship is understood in terms of its narrative character. The teacher is an active participant. The teacher gets to talk. They get to uh, use their knowledge, apply the knowledge that they had learned. They're an active participant. They're the star of the show. They're the narrator. They're the narrator of the whole show. So um, they they typically fill in the gaps. You know, if there's any lulls of silence uh, with their words. They're knowledgeable. They know things. The teacher's existence is necessitated by the ignorant student. So the teacher assumes the students don't know Jack Diddley about Jack Diddley shit, and that's why uh, the uh, her existence or his existence is there because since they don't know Jack shit, I'm here to provide them with the knowledge that they do not have. It's thinking of like a uh, education is like a glass that you can pour in and then once it's filled then it's like okay I'm done with my education and then you can go on with life education don't work that way that's not how education is education is is like a flower and you water it and you fertilize it and then it blooms you know on its own accord so that's that's just like us our biology should unfold and we should be led to the water to drink it but not forced to the water to drink it the water could be a, over uh, a fracking site, so there could be poison in that water, and it very well could be a good idea for them to not be uh, completely obedient to any authority figures, to any adult authority figures, since that doesn't always work. Uh, you can uh, look at the Catholic priest and the Catholic faith. Uh, those kids um, trusted, you know, adult authority figures and look what happened so obedience is is not uh, is not a virtue in any sense of the word actually uh, but even more so if if you're obedient to a person that wants to do you harm so the teacher uh, the description of reality is static so the description of history is is static so it's never changing it just stays right there in place uh, it's unchanging it's stationary so they understand the world and they understand it in you know dark black and white contrasting terms this is exactly how I see things and um, examples do not draw from the students uh, exist uh, existential experiences so 
the examples don't come from the experiences of the students. Uh, teachers without an explanation of meaning. There is one class, a hip hop culture class, where we spent two days talking about the definition of what hip hop was, and then we spent you know, one day about hip hop and the other day about culture, and we didn't define it. Nobody came up with any consensus or agreement on what hip hop or culture was, but we still carried on with the class. It didn't matter. Let's just carry on. We don't know what the definition of these words are, so therefore, since we don't agree on a definition, we can't actually communicate or talk to each other about this. Uh, so, that's teachers without an explanation of meaning, education without meaning, rote memorization without understanding, uh, just memorizing, just to be memorizing, you're not actually putting it into the context of your life, you know, why do I need to know that Frank first the capital of Kentucky, uh, why do I need to know that Daniel Boone killed a bunch of Indians, um, so, you know, there's got to be uh, uh, an, an understanding behind just, not just memorization, but you got to have an understanding that backs the memorization for the knowledge to be useful. Narration is memor memorized without contextualization so they have the same PowerPoint display that they give year after year. Now if it's physics that makes sense but if it's uh, social sciences, if it's social studies or if it's um, uh, you know more uh, uh, classes where group work and uh, active participation would make more sense um, then, then that's a bad thing. You need to you need to change things up because there's always new things that's happening every year. Um, and also, the teacher is a gift giver, and they believe that the gift that they're given is knowledge. So here's all my facts. Here's the knowledge I have. And since I'm giving you this gift, um, you should respect me. Since I'm giving you this gift, you know, for fifty thousand dollars, which is what my tuition were, uh, this is a gift that I'm actually handing it to you. Better teachers have more content to give. Uh, that's the assumption. That's not true. Uh, just because you got more content, that doesn't mean you actually know what you're talking about. Especially um, if, if like you're a Nazi. If you're, if you're a Nazi and all you did was point out a bunch of ways and how fascism uh, was successful, then then you're you're brainwashing your kids into thinking that or your students that they uh, that they should be fascist Nazis themselves. Now the assumption for the students is that they're, they're the sit down and shut up listeners. They stay in their seat. They're ignorant. Um, they're not willfully ignorant, but just don't know the, the facts that you know. Uh, they're just a receptacle. So you just kind of just just keep on throwing, just throw a bunch of information in, in there into this receptacle, into this brain. Um, they, they fail to recognize their ability to educate the teacher. They don't realize that they have knowledge that they could actually teach the teacher about and um, so let's see they're passive recipient so they accept the gift of knowledge they sit there and just soak it in oh give me facts and I'm, I'm it's all getting in my head if you ever talk to any of the students outside of class you can see that they're nothing like the professors and in fact they're they're stupid they don't know they don't know jack shit about jack shit but the fact that they sit there in class and uh, act like the the show makes sense to them it makes no sense to me the more passive, the better the student. So the more that the student just sits there and doesn't ask questions and doesn't say anything, the, the, the better the teacher thinks that they are. So the more passive the student, the more of a receptacle. Uh, the problem with that is that the, they'll be less critically, uh, less critical about the world. So the student won't engage the world as critically if they were just uh, a passive receptacle to the knowledge. There's also limits. Uh, the, the banking concept of education assumes that there are limits to student creativity. Uh, but what limited creativity does is that it serves the interest of the oppressor. Uh, I, I, believe, I believe everybody's creative. And in fact, when it comes to language, we're all creative. We all come up with um, our own uh, interesting words that come up out of our mouths. So, you know. The... Um, there's also what so what you know what's the solution to all this right well the solution according to Paul Freire is the humanist revolutionary educator um, to have a revolutionary educator but I'm gonna get to that in a second I actually want to go through what's in the book and it basically says everything the same thing but I'm just gonna regurgitate a lot of it so the banking concept of education this is where knowledge is a gift that's bestowed uh, by those who consider themselves knowledgeable uh, upon those whom they consider to know nothing. So projecting an absolute ignorance onto others, a characteristic of the ideology of oppression, negates education and knowledge as a process of inquiry. 
The teacher presents himself to the students as their necessary opposite. By considering their ignorance absolute, he justifies his own existence. The students, alienated like the slave in the Hegelian dialectic, accept their ignorance as justifying the teacher's existence. Uh, but unlike the slave, they never discover that they educate the teacher. So the solution is not, nor can it ever be found in the banking concept. On the contrary, banking education maintains and even stimulates the contradiction through the following attitudes and practices, which mirror oppressive society as a whole. So A, the teacher teaches and the, te the students are taught. B, the student knows everything and the students know nothing. C, the teacher thinks and the students are thought about. D, the teacher talks and the students listen meekly. The, student, the teacher disciplines and the students are disciplined. The teacher chooses and enforces his choice and the students comply. The teacher acts and the students have the illusion of acting through the action of the teacher. H, the student chooses the program content and the students who were not consulted adapt to it. I, the teacher, confuses the authority of knowledge with his or her own professional authority, where, which she and he sets in opposition to the freedom of the students. And J, the teacher is the subject of the learning process, while the pupils are mere objects. It's not surprising that the banking concept of education um, regards men as adaptable, manageable beings. The more students work at storing their deposits and trust to them, the less they develop the critical consciousness, which will result from their intervention in the world as transformers of that world. The more completely they accept the passive role imposed on them, the more they tend simply to adapt to the world as it is and to the fragmented view of reality deposited in them. So that's, that's from Freire's own mouth. Um, so the solution, so it's a solution, okay? Traditionally, I've been taught the banking education, the banking model of education since I've been five years old. Always got a dictator. The rest of us just shut up, sit down. Um, and, and if you speak at it, if you have an independent thought, sometimes you can get a professor or teacher that actually has a dialogue with you. And I would say uh, Trisha Gray at UofL was really good with that. It, it wasn't democratic, but every question, any comment I had, she, you know, she would field it. And she would say, yeah, that's a good point. Or no, I kind of look at things this way. So it was a dialogue, uh, but so many teachers, it's just a monologue, and that's it. It's just a monologue, so they're just talking to themselves. They don't know if we're listening. They don't know if our mind is right. In fact, just like what I was saying with the hip-hop culture, since we didn't even have a fundamental foundation uh, of which to talk from, we didn't have a definition for those words, then, then who knows if anybody was saying anything that made any sense to anybody else. If hip hop is different to you and hip hop if culture is different to you, when I say hip hop culture, that could be a completely different concept than what it means for you. So, uh, things that we need to learn is that students and teachers are both identified as uh, subjects when there's co intentional education. And what this does is it uh, presupposes that both can educate each other. Teacher could educate the students. And we learned that knowledge is co created instead of uh, both active both people are active instead of one active and one passive you got two active learners so knowledge is co-created uh, both people are uh, creating a new reality there's people that comes in with new information you come up with new information and then there's information combined and then you fit it into your schema in your brain and uh, new knowledge is created or or old knowledge is uh, re-established so the praxis the uh, the point uh, the process that always must be shared throughout the learning process is that you have to have shared reflection, shared critical dialogue, and shared action. So action, critical dialogue, and reflection. The role of the humanist revolutionary educator is they continuously are motivated to engage students in critical thinking. And they are concerned with mutual humanization. And freedom is a necessary but not sufficient condition uh, for humanization. The human, humanist revolutionary educator establishes trust in the student, establishes the condition for creativity instead of just memorization, and it recognizes the dynamic between the student-teacher partnership, how there needs to be mutual activity, mutual contribution, mutual exchange of knowledge. And what this happens is that they both co-create mutual liberation. Education should not be oppressive. Education should be liberating. So the only way you can do that is if you're a humanist revolutionary educator. So Paula Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Check it out.